Um, today we are going to continue talking about T-cell activation. And as if you recall, I told you guys last time that dendritic cells are the best cells at activating T cells. And so if we want to fully understand some pieces of T cell activation, we need to know a couple of things about dendritic cells and dendritic cell activation. Um, and in fact, they, some information on that front will also come up on Monday, but we need to talk about some of it today. I, so I sort of left off talking about dendritic cell activation last time. Um, dendritic cells can be either immature or mature. The dendritic cells start out as immature dendritic cells in different tissues, and they will, are able to do a lot of phagocytosis at that point. So um, those immature dendritic cells, um, when they, after they do phagocytosis, if they, say, encounter a PAMP, they will, or a MAMP, um, in their phagocytosis process, they will get activated. That will make that dendritic cell travel to the lymph node and also be activated to have a lot more proteins on the cell surface. Um, that dendritic cell will specifically, when I say it migrates, it moves to the lymph node. So it's going to go to the right place to turn on T cells. And it's also going to make a lot of cell surface proteins, one of which we're going to hear a lot more about in a few slides, um, that are really useful for activating T cells. So we need to remember that. Um, because, if we're, as I mentioned, dendritic cells are the best cells for activating T cells. Um, and in a lot of ways, we think about, in sort of the perfect textbook world of immunology, um, whenever, if we really want to turn on a naive T cell, we think about the fact that we might want to have a dendritic cell do it. Okay? Yes, you can turn it on with something other than a dendritic cell, but in like the perfect world <laughs> textbook way, you kind of want a dendritic cell to do it because they're so good. That actually leads to an MHC problem. So one thing is really good. Dendritic cells are professional antigen presenting cells. They have the ability to present on MHC class one because they're nucleated cells and MHC class two. So they can do both of the things shown here. They can do MHC class one presentation and they can do MHC class two presentation. But we come up with a problem. And I'm sort of laughing to myself as I describe this problem to you, because first, this is another place where every immunologist seems to use the same example. It's, it's the example. Um, there's like a, probably a million examples one could use. Everybody always uses the same one, to the point where at one point, my sister was in an immunology class, called me, and was like, they were explaining something, and I don't really understand what it was, and there's this problem, and it says something about this, and I was like, it's about this issue, simply because it was that example, that I knew that they, they were actually trying to explain this, because um, it's just like, everyone always uses it. Um, so let's imagine hepatitis, a hepatitis virus, particularly hepatitis B virus. Hepatitis viruses infect the liver because hepatitis talks about liver. Liver inflammation is what hepatitis means. So they infect the liver, right? And viruses are generally pretty picky in terms of what kind of cells they infect. They only infect one kind of cell. And so we'll say that hepatitis B only infects liver cells. If you get infected with hepatitis B virus, you would like to have some T cells kill the infected cells and get rid of hepatitis B virus, right? That's kind of what you want to have happen. If you want those T cells to be awesome, they should be turned on by a dendritic cell. Yeah? There's a problem with that scheme 
because if you recall, MHC class one presents peptides from the cytoplasm. Of, and usually the way we get something into the cytoplasm is by infecting the cell. If hepatitis B doesn't infect dendritic cells, it only infects liver cells, how can we get a dendritic cell to turn on the T cell? Do you guys see the problem? So there's this issue of if dendritic cells aren't actually infected with some viruses, how do we get a good CD8 T cell response turned on? How do we get that antigen on MHC class one and turn things on? Um, I know some of you guys were sort of asking a bunch of questions on a past problem set um, where I had a virus that was infecting a dendritic cell. Um, and one of the reasons why I was doing that is because I talk about this issue in different places, different years. And so I was trying to get around this issue. <laughs> with that question is that the virus infected the dendritic cell in that problem set. So we didn't have to worry about this problem. But there are lots of viruses that don't infect dendritic cells. And then how the heck are we supposed to turn on a good CD8 T cell response? Um, dendritic cells have a special ability. They can do an additional uh, MHC presentation pathway or an additional type of MHC presentation pathway. This presentation pathway is called cross-presentation. So dendritic cells have the ability to cross-present. What cross-presentation means is that we can phag the dendritic cell can phagocytose stuff. It will go into a phagosome. Remember that the phagosome is usually a place where we have antigens that go on to class two. So we're in that class two pathway. Dendritic cells can actually have some antigens leak out of the phagosome or be removed from the phagosome and go into the cytoplasm. And those antigens can also go on to class one. So dendritic cells can have some proteins that are in the phagosome go into their cytoplasm and also go on to class one. Um, so you can actually see this in, your, in this figure from your textbook where cross-presentation sometimes happens where an antigen that was phagocytosed will get into the cytoplasm and eventually end up on class one. Some of the specific steps and details of how that happens are still not completely understood. And so we've got some magic arrows here. And in some ways, the magic arrows is the best is what we got. Um, in terms of knowing exactly how it happens. But dendritic cells do have this way of releasing antigen from the endocytic pathway into the cytoplasm. So dendritic cells can, in fact, also present antigens they phagocytosed on class one, which is really important for turning on a good CD8 T cell response. Yep, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, do, it is presenting both. It's not 100% of it that leaks. Um, and I guess the other thing that I didn't mention is if we're in this example of hepatitis B and we have some cells of our liver that are infected with hepatitis B virus, um, I said dendritic cells phagocytose, but I didn't actually say what they phagocytosed. Usually what happens is that some of the infected cells die and the dendritic cells are phagocytosing dead cells that have been infected. So you can see this is a dead cell <laughs> that got infected with red dot. <laughs> so we phagocytose the dead cell and its included antigen, red dot. <laughs> and that red dot gets, can get released into the cytoplasm. So there is this other process called cross-presentation. Um, I, I'm not going to, you know, try to trick you on exams with cross-presentation or something like that. At the same time, it is a critical way that we make CD8 T cell responses to some antigens, so I cannot not tell you about it. <laughs> um, and it's really particularly important because dendritic cells are so good at activating T cells. Yep? Mm-hmm. Mm 
um, it actually doesn't matter um, in reality. Um, that will come up more on a little bit today and a little bit on Monday, but it actually doesn't matter. Okay? Um, so we'll, I'll come back to that on Monday. Remind me on Monday when I start talking about the CD8 T cell actually doing its job. So the reason why this is important is the same thing I already told you. Um, so today we're going to continue thinking about those steps of activating T cells. This is often, this is of course involving an antigen presenting cell like the dendritic cell, which is why I had to tell you about that. Um, I mean, I'll just talk about signal one and signal two. Um, sometimes people talk about signal three, sometimes people just say cytokines. Um, and we talked about signal one last time. And we need to talk about um, some details of this signal two and this cytokine uh, production um, in order to fully understand this. Uh, I would say that I find the next sort of couple of slides that I'm going to show you to be some of the most important things about T cell biology to me. <laughs> Just there are things that I am like think are so fundamentally important. Um, in order to actually turn on a T cell, signal one is not enough. If you want to turn on a T cell, the T cell needs to get two signals, signal one and signal two. Um, signal one is that signal we saw last time, which is coming through the T cell receptor and its friends, the co-receptors, so CD4 and CD8 and CD3. Signal two is going to come through an additional protein-protein interaction. So it's a different protein on the T cell. It's a different protein on the antigen presenting cell. So it's sort of its own complex. It's actually going to lead to its own signaling cascade that will eventually kind of improve the other one but it is officially separate. And so this is known as the co-stimulatory signal. All of this is the, is the receptor and co-receptor. This is uh, known as the co-stimulator. Um, in reality, there are lots and lots of co-stimulators that can happen. We're only gonna talk about the famous co-stimulator here. Um, I'll mention a little bit about some other ones as, uh, closer to the end today, but really mostly I'm talking about the big co-stimulator here today. Um, which is, in fact, the protein on the T cell called CD28, which combined to two different proteins on the um, antigen presenting cell. So there's two choices. One of those is called CD80. The other one is called CD86. Before these got CD names, they had other names, um, which were B71 and B72. I will generally refer to them as B7. <laughs> They're the B7s. Um, so CD80, CD86, or B7, all kind of the same thing. They're all on an antigen presenting cell um, and bind to CD28, which is on a T cell, in order to give a co-stimulatory signal. And our T cell cannot be turned on unless it receives both signal one and signal two. One of the questions you might ask is, why does the antigen presenting cell make B7? Why does the antigen presenting cell decide now is a good time to make B7? Because in fact, antigen presenting cells do not always make B7. They only make B7 sometimes. So they can only turn on a T cell sometimes. Um, sort of relating to what I told you before, dendritic cells are amazing at making B7. That's why dendritic cells are so good at turning on T cells, is because dendritic cells are just so awesome at making B7. Um, also, there is sort of this cytokine thing that we will see a little bit later, and you might similarly wonder, why does this antigen presenting cell decide to make some cytokines? Why does it decide now is a good time to make cytokines to turn on T cells? It turns out you actually already know the answer to both of those questions, but you don't realize them, that you know it. Antigen presenting cells 
make cytokines and co-stimulatory molecules as a result of PRR signaling. Um, I am going to kind of tell you a name for sort of this theory. Um, when I was first learning immunology, the name for this theory was one of uh, a couple of phrases that immunologists thought, like, laughed at and thought was wrong theory. And so it's one of two sentences, two phrases I, was, I specifically learned never say. So every time I teach it, I feel like I'm going to get struck by lightning. So we're going to learn this, and we're going to hope I don't hope I make it through another year without getting struck by lightning. There's another term that makes me feel like I'm going to get struck by lightning. It comes up on Monday. So we got two days I got to not, not get struck. Um, so the idea here is, if you remember, our antigen-presenting cells, and in fact all cells of the body, are presenting on MHC class 1 all the time, right? Self-peptides. And if you remember, we had this problem with T cells during T cell development, that every T cell is slightly self-reactive. So all our self-peptides are getting presented on class 1. All of our T cells are self-reactive. We should be dead. Big reason why we're not dead is because of this need for signal 1 and signal 2. A T cell doesn't just get turned on when it sees its antigen on MHC. That's signal 1. The T cell has to have signal 2 to get turned on. And while antigen presenting cells may be presenting on class 1 at all times, they're not making co-stimulatory molecules signal 2 all the time. The reason why they make signal 2 is because they've got some sort of PRR signaling. So the idea here, this is known as the danger signal hypothesis. Look at me saying danger. Um, where when this cell gets uh, PRR stimulation, that's sort of a sign you got something dangerous. Some antigen that you have in your cell was associated with a PRR. There's something bad going on. If you don't, if there are no PRRs around, then most likely the antigens you're showing, the antigens you're presenting must be self. So you don't actually really want to turn on a T cell. But if you start to have danger, if there's some danger associated with your antigens, if there's some danger going on and you decide there's danger because you got PRR signals, then you say, oh, I, I need to turn on T cells now. I'm going to also show my co-stimulatory molecule. And in fact, I'm also going to make some cytokines, which are also going to be helpful in turning on the adaptive immune system. When we talked about PRRs before, I told you that one important aspect of them was turning on adaptive immunity. Now I'm telling you this, more of the specifics about turning on adaptive immunity. Particularly, one of the major important things about PRRs is their ability to turn on co-stim molecules, their ability to turn on B7. Um, as well as cytokines. And so this actually leads to this super important aspect of T cell biology. And so this is one big piece of it. Your T cell oops, requires two signals to be activated. The T cell has to see MHC plus peptide using its T cell receptor. And the T cell has to see B7 using CD28. Only when it gets both of these things will that T cell get turned on. Okay? Does this make sense? This is like a super important thing. Okay. So there's another piece onto this super important thing. So that's why I'm checking to make sure you get it, get this much already. Yes, Rishi. Okay, so a T cell only gets turned on if it gets both signal 1 and signal 2, okay? So it has to see both antigen and kind of like a there was some danger around <laughs> signal, okay? Okay, that's the only way the T cell gets turned on. The other piece to this is what happens if the T cell sees signal 1 without signal 2. So what could you imagine would be a situation where the T cell would see signal 1 without seeing signal 2? What would that situation be? T 
cell sees its antigen on MHC, but there's no B7 around. When might that happen? Yep. So, yeah, so now if a T cell is responding to a self peptide, you know, because all of your cells are presenting self peptides all day long, then if a T cell, which comes out of the thymus self reactive, happens to find its peptide, there's not going to be B7 around. So there's not, we're not, we're going to get signal one without signal two. And in that situation, where the T cell gets signal one without signal two, not only is the T cell not turned on, the T cell is actually turned off. The T cell is energized. So basically, we are going to say, oh, no, you must be self-reactive. If you're getting signal one without signal two, something bad's going on. You're being self-reactive. We're going to shut you off. So if a T cell gets signal one and signal two, it becomes activated and gets to actually do its function. If the T cell gets signal one without signal two, that T cell becomes energic. So with B cells, we saw energy happening in development of the B cell. In T cells, energy happens in the periphery um, based on how the activation happens. And so this is one of the major reasons why it's OK that T cells are coming out of the thymus partially self-reactive because they can't get turned on by just self-antigen in the periphery. They have to get turned on by self-antigen or by antigen plus a co-stem signal. Yep. <laughs> yes. That's a really good question. <laughs> we'll talk about that when we do cancer immunology. <laughs> I would don't want to spend like 20 minutes right now <laughs> answering that question. Although I am going to mention a couple things about cancer at the end today. But the real answer to your question comes up with cancer immunology. Great question. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to remind you that you know we generate all of these T cells that are somewhat self-reactive. Every T cell that gets out of the thymus had to have low affinity for self-antigen. And we might say, well, that seems really pointless. Why would we want to do that? One reason is because we don't have any other things in the thymus to do selection with. And we have to actually see if that T cell binds to MHC. And the hope is that if that T cell binds to, with low affinity, it's getting some of that affinity from the MHC. And Maybe there's a peptide that's really similar to that self-peptide from a, a microbe with just a couple different amino acids. So now the self-peptide, here's a self-peptide example, might give that T cell a weak signal. But maybe this foreign peptide, this peptide from this virus, might give the T cell a stronger signal. So we're saying, well, maybe the weak ones bind to self weakly, but maybe they bind to something else more strongly. So we keep them around. With then the idea being that um, they're not, even if they happen to run into HLA-DR, or even if we're in this situation where the peptides are entirely identical, that T cell is not going to get turned on unless it happens to also see signal two. Uh-huh. Yep. 100 percent yes. Um, definitely coming up with part of that's one issue with this that we talk about when we talk about autoimmunity. <laughs> so yes, you guys are thinking ahead. <laughs> um, so um, that's the other reason why this sort of energy piece is important is that you don't want that T cell. If, it, if the first time it leaves the thymus and it sees its antigen, it's a self-reactive antigen, you want to turn that off so that you don't get those auto, potential autoimmunity problems later. Um, and so that's kind of this importance of signal one and signal two. 
Um, this is so important that if you are doing experiments in the lab, um, you actually have to add um, something to stimulate signal one and something to stimulate signal two in order to get T cells turned on well, even in a dish. You try to turn on T cells with just, um, with nothing, you don't get anything. You just give a signal one, nothing. Just a signal two, nothing. This is a really strong signal one. These are, these are two really strong signal ones. They're not great. You add signal one and signal two, it's way better <laughs> in each case. Um, the other thing I forgot to mention, and this comes up as a question sometimes for students, is, OK, so we see what happens if you get signal one and signal two. We see what happens if you get signal one without signal two. Sometimes people say, well, what happens if you get signal two without signal one? What if you just get signal two? And the answer is T cells don't care. No activation, no nothing. Signal two only, only matters when it's being added to signal one. So signal two without signal one, nothing. Um, all right, so that's kind of what I'm going to tell you about COSTIM now. Um, the other, the slight brief thing I'm going to say right now is that in the real world, there are actually lots of co-stimulatory molecules, not just um, uh, CD28 binding to B7. There are lots and lots of other ones. You can see some of those other ones here. Um, at the end today, I'm going to talk a little bit about one other protein that's on this slide. But know that in the real world, there's way more than just um, CD28 and B7. One that you, some of you may have heard of before, I'm just going to name check it right now. And again, we can talk about the details of it later. But some of you may have heard of PD-1 um, and its ligands PD-L1, which are pretty important clinically. Um, they are being used, um, things to, that hit them are you being used clinically a lot. You can think of PD-1 and PD-L1 as basically being very similar to this. Um, and we'll see them again later. But if you've heard of them, this is actually where they come in. Um, before I say anything else about um, the details of uh, other aspects of COSTIM, I want to say a couple of things about the signal three of cytokines. There are a few cytokines that can be involved in this process. Some of those cytokines are Monday's problem. I'm, I'm going to tell you about one of those cytokines today. And I will just tell you that there are some other aspects of this cytokineness that we talk about on Monday. Um, so there's one cytokine that is, act, is really important for turning on a T cell, no matter what kind of T cell it is no matter what's going on with that T cell. Every T cell needs this cytokine. And so I want to tell you about this one cytokine that every T cell needs. This cytokine is a cytokine called IL-2. You have previously heard of IL-2. Where have you heard of IL-2? Yeah, Rishi. It's the stuff from Wednesday. Yes, Addy. Yeah, so when we talked about transcription factors and signaling, um, as Rishi said from Wednesday, our goal was for the T cell to transcribe IL-2. So IL-2 is like the super important cytokine in this whole process. So it's the same one. It's the same old IL-2. When IL-2 was first described, its name wasn't IL-2. You do not need to know this name at all, but sometimes it helps you. It helps people, so that's why I say it. When IL-2 was first found, its name was T-cell growth factor. So that might tell you what it does. <laughs> uh, and so what will happen is that when our T-cell is activated well, that T cell will start to make IL-2. 
and that T cell will start to secrete IL-2, just like it can secrete, uh, different cells secrete other cytokines after they transcribe them. That IL-2 can actually act back on the same cell where the cell could feed itself the IL-2. Um, this is known as an autocrine signaling process. Um, that T cell can also um, feed that IL-2 to like its neighbor. Usually when the T cells are getting activated, they're really close together. The IL-2 is not gonna like go through the bloodstream to the whole body. It could go from the T cell back to itself or the T cell back to the other T cell that it's very, very close to. <laughs> Um, those are called autocrine and paracrine signaling processes. And so our T cell is going to have an IL-2 receptor on its surface. You can see IL-2 hitting the IL-2 receptor. That's going to push the cell into cell cycle. So we're going to see cell divisions. See, several divisions. Otherwise known as proliferation. <laughs> um, and those cells are also going to differentiate. So they're going to gain some functions. And one thing that's not shown here exactly, um, but this IL-2 also helps the T cell survive. So it actually will give the T cell the ability to survive, to proliferate, and to differentiate. You don't get a good T cell turned on unless you do IL-2, have IL-2 there. And usually the T cell makes the IL-2 itself and feeds it to itself. When I t try to do any experiments with T cells in the lab, I add in IL-2 to really make it work. So T cells always need IL-2. Um, IL-2 is one of, is part of a family of cytokines. So cytokines in general can be divided up into families based on structural things. And IL-2 is part of a family of cytokines. And so I wanna tell you a couple things about that family and sort of some specifics of IL-2. Um, so IL-2, is part of a family of cytokines known as the gamma chain family of cytokines. The gamma chain family of cytokines has the name the gamma chain family of cytokines because they all um, use one protein as part of their receptor called the gamma chain, or usually the common gamma chain. So you can see the IL-2 receptor has this gamma chain as well as two other proteins that are part of it, alpha and beta. Um, IL-15 has the gamma chain, alpha and beta. IL-7, you guys have heard about IL-7 earlier this semester. It was the thing that developing B cells needed in the bone marrow and developing T cells needed in the thymus. IL-7 has a receptor plus the gamma chain. IL-9, IL-4, also IL-21, which I did my PhD on. I have so many versions of this slide. <laughs> um, so all of these cytokines signal through this common gamma chain. Um, the reason why this is important, uh, the, and that I'm mentioning there is this family, is that you guys have heard of boy in a bubble syndrome, or SCID, right? The most common mutation in SCID is a mutation in the, in the gamma chain. And so those, it's on the X chromosome, so usually the people who have this are boys. Those boys are not making this protein, the common gamma chain. That means IL-2 can't signal in them because they don't have an IL-2 receptor, so this is missing. But it also means IL-15 doesn't signal in them because this is missing, same protein's missing, and it's involved in IL-2 signaling. And IL-7 doesn't signal in them. And IL-9 doesn't signal in them. And IL-4 doesn't signal in them. And IL-21 doesn't signal in them. As a result, they can't do this step of turning on T cells and doing T cell activation, feeding the T cells that I've been telling you about. Because of the IL-7 thing, they can't feed developing B cells. They also can't feed developing T cells. Um, some of these other cytokines are also important for some other um, innate immune cell types. And so as a result of not having this one cytokine receptor protein, their whole adaptive immune system is 
gone. Um, and so this is the um, sort of first immunodeficiency most people hear about, and it's all the result of the common gamma chain. Um, and so that's one reason why I feel like it's important that you know what the common gamma chain is. Um, today we're specifically thinking about it as one of the parts of the IL-2 receptor, but I just wanted you to know it is involved with these other cytokines, some of whom are very important cytokines that we will see going forward. Um, the IL-2 receptor can be uh, seen in um, three different ways. If we just have the alpha chain, um, it does bind to IL-2, but it's pretty low affinity. Um, if we have beta and gamma, we combine to IL-2 with medium affinity. If we have all three, we get the high affinity IL-2 receptor. Um, this, is that, this is from your textbook. This is from another textbook. Um, I'm going to shift the order of slides because I think it makes more sense to do it this way. And so what will happen in our T cell before our T cell is activated, our T cell has the IL-2 gene, but it's not transcribing it yet. We didn't do all that signaling from Wednesday to transcribe this. If we get a signal, like we, get the sig we do Wednesday signal transduction, we're going to start transcribing it. And as a result, we're going to make the protein. See, we've got an orange triangle that goes with the orange gene. And we can secrete that. What you will notice is that at the beginning, the T cell has a receptor that just has two of the chains, not all three. Just has beta and gamma. This is the intermediate strength receptor. T cell starts making IL-2, starts feeding itself IL-2. It also starts making the high affinity receptor. And so it starts making the final chain, alpha, and now it has the really good receptor. <laughs> and now that T cell can proliferate and survive and differentiate. Um, and so IL-2 is sort of the other really key feature for turning on all T cells to make a really good T cell response. There are other cytokines. They end, it ends up being different cytokines being important for different types of T cells, and that is, again, Monday's problem. Today's problem is that everybody needs IL-2. It's just sometimes they need stuff besides IL-2, okay? I need to tell you a little bit about how cytokines signal as well, okay? In general, cytokines signal through cytokine receptors. In the case of IL-2, it's this receptor that you're seeing here with the alpha, beta, and gamma chain. Um, if we look back at the cytokine receptor I was telling you before, um, some of them have just two chains. There are other families besides this family. Generally, this, they always have two chains in the receptor. But we got to talk about how the signaling works downstream of cytokine receptors. All cytokine receptors have pretty much the same kind of, same big picture kind of signaling that happens with them. Um, and you can see this uh, signal transduction process happening here. Um, cytokine signaling. Um, it, the, the specific signaling process that we're going to talk about is known as the JAK-STAT pathway. You can see a cytokine with two different receptor chains shown here. This is a very vague image because um, we're talking about cytokines in general here. Those um, receptor chains travel with a partner protein, okay? That partner protein is a protein that has a kinase as well as uh, a kinase. There is actually a tyrosine sort of in this general area as well. And there's this other part, okay? 
And this other part, so this is the kinase part, this other part The other part binds to phosphorylated tyrosines. Um, and so you can kind of see there are two important parts of this protein. Um, if you ask, if you, if you read in textbooks about these proteins, you will find out fancy reasons for their names. So this, there are two important parts. So the idea was that these Kinases were named after a Roman god, Janus, who has two faces. And so this, these were the proteins with two faces. And they were known as the Janus kinases. Or Jack. And so what will happen is that our Jacks, our Janus kinases, will get phosphorylated. I'm very bad at drawing. And you'll get sort of two of them that will bind together like this. Each one will, will have its tyrosine get phosphorylated. And that will bind to another one. And you can see that drawn in a much nicer way up here, <laughs> where they're each phosphorylating each other and they're binding together to make this sort of complex. So this is what happens with the, with the jacks. Because they have two faces, they can sort of bind together in this way. Um, I am told by immunologists who were in the field at the time that when the jacks were originally discovered, people were looking at immunodeficiencies like SCID that I told you about and thinking, oh my gosh, I, we found a cool gene that's sometimes mutated in people who have SCID, people who have immunodeficiency. We're going to learn all sorts of stuff about immunodeficiency. We are so excited to figure out what this gene does. And then they studied the gene, and then they felt sad because they realized they had discovered just another kinase. And so they say that it did not originally stand for Janus kinase. That was like a fancy thing somebody made up after the fact, that originally Jack stood for just another kinase. Yes? The, the um, structure will not allow it for self-binding. Um, in general, I'll also tell you there are four total jacks that we know of in hum humans. So there's jack one, jack two, jack three, and tick two, because obviously. Um, and so some, one of the things that will differ from cytokine to cytokine is which jack is with the receptor and sort of which combos of jacks we're getting. But right now, all we care about is that there's a jack. When the jacks are active, when these kinases are active, they can phosphorylate stuff. The things that the jacks phosphorylate are called stats. Remember, this pathway is called the jack-stat pathway. Um, and so you can see the jacks are going to phosphorylate the stats. That stands for signal transducer and activator of transcription. That's a very fancy way of saying stats are a transcription factor. When stats are phosphorylated, they dimerize and go into the nucleus and do transcription. So in the end, the entire jack stat pathway downstream of a receptor is receptor jack stat. That's it. 
Um, so you can see the stat gets phosphorylated, makes a dimer, goes in and does the transcription. Again, there are actually six different kinds of stats, and so which stat and which combo um, is really important here. But we see JAK stat signaling with all of our cytokines. Um, every cytokine, every cytokine receptor has JAK stat signaling. So now you know all the ins and outs of JAK stat signaling. It's terribly complicated. Um, and so that will allow our cell to get activated. And so the steps that we have seen at this point are sort of these steps where our T cell is getting activated. We can see our T cell uh, having signal one and signal two, inducing that T cell to make IL-2, which feeds back on the cell's own IL-2 receptor. Um, and that can allow the cell to proliferate and make many copies of itself. It's going to allow the cell to survive. And it's also going to allow the cells to differentiate and pick up some new effector functions. And like I said, those effector functions are really going to be Monday's problem. There is one other side to T cell activation that I need to tell you about today. When we think about T cell activation, and when we think about a T cell response, and if we draw a characteristic T cell response, it looks like this. You can see both a view from a textbook and an actual uh, version from a paper, which is you can see that we get a peak of the response. And then you can see that response actually um, comes back down. We contract that response. Um, it ends up at a higher place than it was where we started, but we see that that response contracts. Um, this contraction phase is very important, and it is actually something that the T cell learns how to do and figures out how to do when it gets turned on. Basically, when the T cell gets turned on, it starts making off an off switch. Because we don't want that cell to be on forever. We want that cell to be able to get turned off. And so when a T cell is activated, it turns on the mechanisms it needs to get turned off later. Um, and in fact, um, I can tell you that when uh, I was in graduate school, one of the projects that some people in my lab were working on was trying to make the contraction phase go away in a T cell response. Because we were, we, we, we were vac giving vaccines. And so we were giving our vaccine, and we were getting this really nice response, and the response was contracting. And we said, man, if it didn't contract and it stayed up here, that would be an awesome vaccine. So we're going to block contraction. And it turns out that no matter what you do, you can't block contraction. If you turn the T cell on, you're also telling the T cell how to contract. Um, in fact, it is often referred to as activation-induced cell death. Um, that these T cells are learning how to do. And so um, in thinking about T cell activation, we need to think a little bit about um, aspects of activation-induced cell death and how the T cell is learning to get turned off at the same time as learning to get turned on. And so basically for the rest of today is the off part of this, after we've already been doing the on part of this. Um, I will also point out that if you, this is showing you a T cell response, you would see the same kinetics, and we'll see this later in the semester, if we were looking at a B cell or an antibody response. AKA, the response should go down. If you think about what you're hearing, what sometimes people are talking about in the media with uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. Oh my gosh, the immune response is waning after you got vaccinated. The immune response is going down. That means there's a disaster. That means you need a booster. Maybe you need 12 boosters. Because the immune response is waning. It's going down. Uh-huh. Good, I'm glad your immune system's doing what it's supposed to. It's supposed to wane. The question is whether it's waning more than it's supposed to. And that's a, that's a much harder question to answer. But some people are freaking out because they're like, it went down. And I'm like, good job. Um, so notice, you can see even from here, and again, we're going to talk about sort of these kinetics issues a little bit more um, in a couple weeks, but you can see even here, we should be having that response contract. 
Um, so in, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, two kind of pieces to this contraction. Um, one thing that I will just mention is that um, one thing that has been shown is activation-induced cell death um, is actually very tightly related to IL-2 as well. Um, so IL-2 is, plays a pretty big role in AICD. Um, but we can think about uh, the types of cell death. And specifically, um, here we are going to be looking at um, an example of apoptosis. So when these cells undergo cell death, they are undergoing apoptosis. We saw pyroptosis earlier uh, in the semester. This is an, an example of uh, apoptosis. Um, realize that with apoptosis, we're going to see um, the chromatin um, actually getting fragmented. We're going to get these little apoptotic bodies made that can get phagocytosed. This is that quiet cell death that I told you about before. The cell death um, that we see in T cells um, happens via signaling, via some proteins called FAS and FAS ligands. And so we can see um, our cell that is going to die will have FAS on its surface. We can get signaling through FAS to lead to apoptosis of the cell. You don't need to get super hung up on all the details of that apoptosis. What I will say to you is that you should notice that FAS turns on caspase 8. And caspase 8 gives us apoptosis both by going through the mitochondria, through all the other apoptosis stuff you've learned about before, and caspase 8 also just directly goes to the bottom and cleaves caspase 3 and skips all the intermediate steps. So we can directly cleave caspase 3 to turn on apoptosis. We can also hit the mitochondria to start the mitochondrial piece to this. Um, and this is all happening downstream of FAS. When a T cell is naive, It does not have FAS on its surface. As soon as a T cell gets activated, that T cell will have the IL-2 receptor, like we talked about before. It will also now have FAS on its surface. So the T cell will turn on FAS as soon as it gets activated. Um, and so the idea, here I'll also put, it had CD28 before, so it could get signal too, and it has a T cell receptor. I'm not going to draw CD4 or 8 because I'm not even telling you if this is a CD4 or 8 T cell. It could be either. <laughs> we still got TCR. We still got CD28. But now we've turned on the high affinity IL-2 receptor, and we've turned on FAS. So as soon as the T cell gets activated, it basically puts up a protein that allows it to get killed. So if that FAS gets bound by its ligand, cleverly named FAS ligand, that T cell gets killed. So as soon as we turn our T cells on, we're turning them on with an off switch or with a safety. Um, and one way we can actually tell that a T cell is an active T cell is because it has FAS on its surface. Um, the FAS ligand can come from a lot of different places. Um, in fact, one place that the FAS ligand can actually come from is the T cell itself. And it can like bend around and kill itself. But we don't need to worry about that right now. Anyway, this is FAS, FAS ligand. Um, the reason, big reason why I'm telling you this is that there are actually some patients who do not, who have mutations in either FAS or FAS ligand. So they do not make FAS or FAS ligand correctly. They do not make those proteins correctly. As a result, their T cells can't, 
be killed. They cannot undergo activation-induced cell death, AICD. What do you think what might happen in that case? Yeah, Rishi. Autoimmunity. Why would there be autoimmunity? Yeah, so the T cells are on. Those T cells might get turned on by binding to some viral antigen. But then they're going to stay on. They're going to stay on forever. And maybe after they finish getting rid of the virus, they're going to start reacting with something that they're self-reactive to and lead to autoimmune disease. They're going to have just way too much T cell activation in this individual. Yeah, Jamie. It might lead to a stronger and longer immune response to virus, but again, it's going to be because it's forever. Right. Eventually, it's going to lead to kind of general autoimmune disease. And this is another case where we're probably going to see autoimmune disease to multiple organs, kind of multiple symptoms, multiple diseases going on, because it's not like one T cell is going to get messed up here. It's all the T cells aren't going to die. One thing I forgot to tell you. is about this clonal expansion phase, this part where the cell is dividing and dividing and dividing. This thing I'm going to tell you, you already know. I'm just making it click in your head. So we're all in the lymphoid organ, like, say, a lymph node right now. Our cell has not left the lymph node to go kill things. We're st that cell is still learning how to be activated in the lymph node. And the cell divides and divides and divides and divides and divides in the lymph node. What happens in the lymph node? What happens to the lymph node? Really easy. Do not overthink this. Yeah. It swells. It gets crowded because it has so many more cells in it now than it used to. And in fact, it swells. You know how you can feel sometimes when you have a swollen lymph node? A swollen lymph node means that you're ha making this immune response. It means that you are having some cell do clonal expansion. It means that this happened to some cell. The reason why I tell you that is in our patients who do not have FAS or FAS ligand signaling, what might you imagine is going to happen with their lymph nodes? Yeah. Uh, they don't usually get to the point of bursting, but yeah, Jamie. Always very, very swollen. And so um, this disease is known as ALPS or autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome. And you can actually visually see the lymph nodes. Um, there's one on her back. Um, so the, the lymph nodes are so swollen that they are visible and sort of easily palpable. And you can find all the lymph nodes in the body in these patients. Because those T cells are not dying ever. Um, and these patients do have uh, frequent autoimmunity. And so um, this programming of the cell to die when we activate it is in fact super super important um, and you can see kind of that this is a bit of an issue in fact um, what you might realize here is our grand plan when i was in graduate school to get rid of contraction was a really dumb idea and if you didn't have contraction if your antibody responses didn't wane to the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, oh no, um, you would actually basically be a walking lymph node at this part of your life. You would have made some immune responses when you were a little kid. You would have had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of cells expand. They wouldn't have died. And you would have no room to make any more responses. You would be out of space in those lymph nodes real fast. And so this contraction phase is, in fact, quite important. And turning the T cells off is quite important. So there's one other piece to this, um, which is about co-stimulatory molecules. I mentioned to you before that there are many co-stimulatory molecules on T cells, and that CD28 was just an example. The other really famous example is one called CTLA-4. And CTLA-4 gives a stop signal, gives an off signal, while CD28 gives an on signal. Just like with FAS, 
when our cell is activated, that cell starts to make CTLA-4. It didn't make CTLA-4 before. The thing that's sort of cool about CTLA-4 is that CTLA-4 also binds to B7. And it binds to B7 more strongly than CD28 does. As a result, we can have this antigen-presenting cell that tries to turn on the T cell. It's showing it signal 1 and signal 2. This gives the cell a turn-on signal. The cell then starts to make CTLA-4. When the cell starts making CTLA-4 and has both CD28 and CTLA-4, the B7 is more likely to bind CTLA-4 because of the higher affinity. CD28 is now alone. And this turns the cell off. So again, the cell basically starts making an off switch once it gets activated. And now the same signal that used to turn that cell on will turn it off. It's sort of like my cat that's like, yeah, pet me, pet me, pet me. OK, now I'm going to bite you. The cell is like, OK, good, I'm getting activated. Oh, wait, now I'm done. Turn me off now. Um, and so CTLA-4 can be expressed by our activated cells so that that response that we're turning on is automatically able to be turned off. Um, I don't have time to show you the rest of the stuff that I have in here. And I, it fits into another lecture, so I'm going to do that. What I will just tell you is that the Nobel Prize in Medicine, I think it was two years ago, was given to the people who discovered CD28 and CTLA-4 because we can use them to impact uh, immune responses to cancer. Um, and so if you've heard of checkpoint inhibitors or checkpoint inhibition, that's CTLA-4 and CD28. Um, and that got the Nobel Prize a couple years ago. So um, we'll talk about that more when we do cancer immunology. Um, and we're going to talk about how T cells actually do something. We're going to get to this T cell effector function business on Monday. Have a great weekend. Remember your problem sets by five.